Hi, thanks so much for coming out tonight. Um, I just started on my book tour, and um, I've done a few events, but this is my first library event, and since um, the book takes place mostly in a library, um, it's really great to be here. What a, what a beautiful place. Thanks for coming out. Um, I'm going to read a little bit from the beginning of the book, and um, then I'll just talk a little bit about how I came to sort of start the novel and what I was thinking about uh, in the beginning of that long six or seven years. Um, I write such short novels that sometimes people are like, how in the world did it take you that long? But I'm a, I'm a bit of a tortoise when it comes to the, the writing process. So um, I'll do that, and then I'd love to open things up to questions for people. So um, I'm going to do that clever trick where you read from the beginning so you don't have to say, oh, well, wait a minute, I'm sorry. Also, that's the uncle, and wait, it takes place in, uh, now it's, now they're, first, now they're in India, and oh, oh, wait, uh, it's not a car, it's a, it's a bird, and you're sort of like, what? By the time the person starts reading. So, anyway, I'm cheating. Um, but I am going to read the epigraph, too, because um, I came across this, uh, sometimes I, I have a fun game where I stroll around libraries, um, and I think of it, kind of is like library roulette, and I go and I just walk up and down um, my public library or sometimes a university library, and the only rule is that it can't be the fiction or poetry section. And um, this was something I came across in a history of the Puritans, and it seemed like a fitting, fitting epigraph. Notes from a town meeting in Milford, Connecticut, 1640. Voted that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, voted that the earth is given to the saints, voted that we are the saints. In the morning, the one who is mostly enlightened comes in. There are stages, and she is in the second to last, she thinks. This stage can only be described by a Japanese word, bucket of black paint it means. I spend some time pulling books for the doomed adjunct. He has been working on his dissertation for 11 years. I give him reams of copy paper, binder clips and pens. He is writing about a philosopher I have never heard of. He is minor, but instrumental, he told me. Minor, but instrumental. But last night, his wife put a piece of paper on the fridge. Is what you're doing Right now, making money, it said. <laughs> the man in the shabby suit does not want his fines lowered. He is pleased to contribute to our library. The blonde girl whose nails are bitten to the quick stops by after lunch and leaves with a purse full of toilet paper. I brave a theory about vaccinations and another about late capitalism. Do you ever wish you were 30 again? asked the lonely heart engineer. No, never, I say. I tell him that old joke about going backward. We don't serve time travelers here. A time traveler walks into the bar. <laughs> On the way home, I pass the lady who sells whirling things. Sometimes, when the students are really stoned, they'll buy them. No takers today, she tells me. I pick out one for my son, Eli. It's blue and white, but blurs to blue in the wind. Don't forget quarters, I remember. At the bodega, Mohan gives me a roll of them. I admire his new cat, but he tells me it just wandered in. He will keep it, though, because his wife no longer loves him. I wish you were a real shrink, my husband says. Then we'd be rich. My brother's late and this after I took a car service, so I wouldn't be. When I finally spot Henry, he's drenched. No coat, no umbrella. He stops at the corner, gives change to the woman in the trash bag poncho. My brother told me once that he missed drugs because they made the world stop calling to him. Fair enough, I said. We were at the supermarket. All around us, things tried to announce their true nature but the radiance was faint, and fainter still, beneath the terrible music. The waitress flirts with him. People used to stop my mother on the street. What a waste, they'd say. 
eyelashes like that on a boy. So now we have extra bread. I eat three pieces while my brother tells me a story about his Narcotics Anonymous meeting. A woman stood up and started ranting about antidepressants. What upset her most was that people were not disposing of them properly. They tested worms in the city sewer and found they contained high concentrations of Paxil and Prozac. When birds ate these worms, they stayed closer to home, made more elaborate nests, but appeared unmotivated to mate. <laughs> but were they happier, I asked him? Did they get more done in a given day? The window in our bedroom is open. You can see the moon if you lean out and crane your neck. The Greeks thought it was the only heavenly object similar to Earth. Plants and animals 15 times stronger than our own inhabited it. My son comes in to show me something. It looks like a pack of gum, but it's really a trick. When you try to take a piece, a metal spring springs down on your finger. It hurts more than you think, he warns me. Ow. I tell him to look out the window. That's a waxing crescent, he says. He knows as much now about the moon as he ever will, I suspect. At his old fancy school, they taught him a song to remember all its phases. Sometimes he'll sing it for us at dinner, but only if we do not request it. The moon will be fine, I think. No one's worrying about the moon. Thank you. So, um, I spend a lot of time in libraries, as I'm guessing many of you do as well. And um, part of that is because we moved around a lot as a kid, when I was a kid. And um, when we come to a new town, that would be sort of the thing that I got to do, was go and take a bunch of books out of the library. Um, and as I've gotten older, it's sort of stayed my happy place. <laughs> so when I go, when I go somewhere, um, I often will check out the town's uh, library. And what I've noticed over the years, um, sometimes I'm sitting there if my, if my daughter is um, going to camp nearby or doing some kind of class, I'll stay in the little local library. And um, one of the things I noticed about that, but as well as the university libraries, was the degree to which uh, they had just become kind of a last version of like, an idea of the commons, a place that people can go for free. Um, nothing is asked of you except that you, there's a few rules, um, but basically it's an open place and it, for me it's always a little vision of what we would be like if we were a more generous society. Um, I've heard people say that now you could never ever get the idea of libraries you know, past the American public. They'd be like, what, people are gonna come in? They're gonna get them for free? What kind of, what kind of lesson is that? You know, that's gonna give people a, a wrong sense of, of, of what they can do in the world. Um, but of course, as other things have frayed, as the social fabric has sort of continued to fray in other areas, um, librarians and people who work in librarians in support positions, um, they've become sort of de facto first responders um, in our society. Not only are they often, um, besides helping people find the books they want, they often help people who are looking for a job navigate how to look things up um, on a job site. They might help people with a resume. Um, some, some libraries now have um, really cool kind of versions of like libraries of things where you can check out, like your blender's broken, but you can get a blender there, or you can check out a toy. Um, and then there's also the whole world um, of the what's happened with the opioid epidemic. And um, a lot of the people who are overdosing are overdosing in libraries. So librarians have also learned to be first responders in that way. Um, how to use Narcan and how to um, revive people and help them get the services they need. So for me, uh, when I began this novel, I knew I wanted it to be about someone who um, was kind of a caretaker who was looking after a lot of people that came her way, um, but also I wanted it to be 
a bookish person. Um, and so the idea of the narrator being a librarian just felt right to me. Um, and I spent lots of time haunting librarian blogs and rabbit holes and that sort of thing. Um, but in the end, I just thought, you can always sort of feel that when you're reading a novel and, and someone has done like a bit of research about the um, thing. And then there's like a scene where, I don't know, someone allegedly does like surgery. And you're like, that doesn't seem quite right. <laughs> so um, I decided ultimately to, um, in the hopes of not dating the novel unduly, um, since the job of a librarian changes so much and since they're often called upon to be kind of technologists, I just stuck to the side of it where people come in and tell you things, um, which uh, is something I notice all the time when I'm in libraries, um, that people come in sometimes who have an exciting story to tell. Sometimes people come in who are lonely. Sometimes people come in who um, have just suffered a great grief. And, um, and the library is one of the things that they feel that they can still do. So um, it was a real joy to kind of set, set it there. And, um, and then as I got deeper into the novel and I knew that it was gonna be about, to some degree, um, coming to terms with what we know about climate change um, and what we think of as this coming emergency. Um, I also just liked the idea of sort of being in the stacks and having all of the records of all the people who've lived in other trying times and, and what they've done. So that was, that was kind of the basis for uh, what I used as a springboard to, to start weather. Could you uh, please share with us the names of both classical and contemporary authors that have either influenced you or that you admire? Mm, okay, well, that's a long list, and yet my mind immediately goes blank. It's one of those, it's, it's one, every once in a while I ask someone a question, and I'm like, oh, that's the question that makes me freeze. Why am I doing that? Um, one writer who I really love, a contemporary writer that um, many of you may know, but um, to some degree can be considered kind of a writer's writer is Joy Williams. Um, she's written both short stories and novels. I'm quite partial to the short stories. Um, she writes these incredibly sort of emotionally dense but very, very funny dark stories. Um, and uh, she's one of those people that when I read, I go back to trying to figure out, it's like watching a magician do a trick, like how how did you carry that off? How did you get that six-year-old to be talking about Rilke? And but we're also like learning how soybeans were grown. Like, uh, so there's something kind of uh, expansive about her vision that I, I really love. Um, I read a lot of poetry. Um, so one of the things that's been really fun for me is um, I found like one poetry press that I just love the things that they put out. So I read a lot of books that come out from Wave, Wave Poetry Press. Um, and that's got all sorts of interesting people on it that I'd, I just recommend checking out their whole catalog. But um, that's where Maggie Nelson started and Mary Rufel and all sorts of interesting folks. Um, if you are curious to um, see more of my musings about books that have influenced me, with my last book, Department, I decided that I wanted to put a little, um, tab on my otherwise rather <laughs> unexciting website. Um, it says half a library, and it comes from that old Samuel Johnson quote, a man must turn over half a library to make one book. And so in that I have, well, you know, John Berryman, Dennis Johnson, Jean Reese, everyone that's, um, you know, Montaigne was somebody that kind of set my brain on fire when I first read that, so. Did anyone warn you against attempting this conjunction of the personal and the public? Mm. I mean, in general, I try not to tell anyone what I'm writing about because there's every single novel I've ever written sounds terrible. I mean, just sounds like I used to work in a bookstore, and 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 one of the things, um, okay. um, one of the things that uh, I will just say as a given is that like none of the books I write, I would have, as a bookstore clerk, been like, yeah, I'm not gonna read that. 
and be like, I really, I could care less about like some, some somebody in Brooklyn who's like, oh, her marriage is failing, and she goes, she can't write her second book. Oh, so sad. You know, I, I, I would just have been completely. And the same thing, like, oh God, like someone's gonna, um, you know, tackle uh, time, uh, climate change, and uh, our seeming descent <laughs> into uh, uh, authoritarianism. Um, you know, in a first-person novel that wouldn't that doesn't sound very good to me um <laughs> but it's fantastic <laughs> no I'm just kidding. um one of one of the things that I'm I've lucky enough that I have an agent and one of the reasons I have an agent is because I myself am so bad at um the equivalent of like the elevator pitch or whatever people say like oh tell me about your and I'm just sort of um, and I remember when I first met her, I went afterwards and I said to my best friend, who is also a novelist, I said, she seems really smart and cool, but I don't know, it was kind of weird. She just kept saying all the things she could do and like, oh, she's just super businessy. And my friend Lydia Millet said, well, what do you want, someone like you? You couldn't, you couldn't sell a novel to save your life. And I was like, that is true. <laughs> this is like 10 years into writing my first novel. Um, so. So sometimes she raises an eyebrow if I tell her what, what the, a novel's about, but often she just kind of says, well, let me see what it turns out like. Sh show it to me then. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk a bit about um, how you uh, formulate and kind of discover the voices of your narrators since they're so distinctive and delightful. Oh, well, thank you. Um, I think I just... I mean, I've become kind of increasingly interested, I guess, over the course of the three novels I've written with, with how to get closer to what feels like the movement of thought to me. Um, I mean, we all know about stream of consciousness, but at least the way I sort of came across it first when I was in school, it's generally kind of these big blocks of texts and the punctuation isn't necessarily um, indicating the thought. It's all, in, in some ways it can feel sort of like a, an onrush of thought. So one of the things that I tried to do as I was working on a style that I was interested in was to, to kind of capture like the doublings back and the moments where um, this narrator um, says something and she may say it in a sort of way where she seems sure of herself but then she like walks it back a little bit or makes a joke or thinks of another way that it could be. Um, and so how to do that without um, it being sort of unbearable? <laughs> um, because we all know that, that thing, like when someone is telling a story or like if someone tries to tell you their dream, you know? Like it's very interesting to think of your own dreams and very uninteresting. That's one of the reasons you know you're in love if in the early days you're like, tell me. What did you dream last night? Um, but, but I say, so how do you kind of, if you're trying to capture thought, um, you know, Wittgenstein warned once about like, that you don't want to have a private language, that, that, that by nature language is meant to be shared. So if it becomes private, then it's like hermetically sealed and no one else can enter into it. So that's what I'm always sort of trying to figure out, like how can I um, open it up to the reader um, as well as kind of, to my mind, capture like a kind of quicksilver movement of things. And, and for me, for, for those of you who haven't um, read anything by me, a lot of times when it, one of the things I do is I, I do have these white spaces or these blocks. Sometimes I, um, I'll put, there's some questions in the book. Um, like this is, she starts answering questions for her former mentor who runs a kind of do me, uh, podcast. And so like this one is, question, what is the philosophy of late capitalism? Answer, two hikers see a hungry bear on the trail ahead of them. One of them takes out his running shoes and puts them on. You can't outrun a bear, the other whispers. I just have to un outrun you, he says. Um, so what I'm, what I'm trying to do here um, is I'm trying to sort of, I guess, my hope is that it's sort of like a collaboration with the reader in a way, that these, that these white spaces allow time for the reader, um, even though they're following this sort of uh, slightly manic <laughs> narration. Um, it allows like a, a, a 
point where you can pause and your own um, set of associations can come in or, um, yeah. So that's, that's always been fun for me, trying to figure out how you can do things. You know, poets do this all the time, but sometimes fiction writers, uh, we, we forget that we can use the actual way it is on the page and the punctuation to do things. So. I was just curious where in the process of writing the novel the you discovered the epigraph and what what you think of epigraphs in general. Mm. Well, I love an epigraph. Um, I do sometimes, because I've taught for many years, sometimes some of my most brilliant students will write their first novel and they'll send it to me in manuscript form and I'll open it and I'll be like, oh, there's seven epigraphs. I so understand the desire to do that. Um, I I do think that maybe you don't want more than one or two because it is it is an opening. It's it's actually the beginning of the book, um, and so. Uh, but there's a sort of scholarly impulse sometimes to. I think I found it about two years into writing the book, but I did know right away that it was the epigraph. I knew it wasn't meant to go in the text um, because by then I was sort of really deep into the. Um, Lizzie, the main character, is sort of um, slowly coming out of what was kind of a twilight knowing. You know, she sort of knew and didn't know um, about what was what was happening in the larger world. Um, and so, when I found that that epigraph, I was also just thinking about how, especially in America, a lot of people who've been lucky enough to have some some good things in their life, some ease in their life. The sense that voted that we are the saints <laughs> um, can can seem like it is actually a secret refrain of of many people. Um, and and I, you know, the older I get, the less the less I believe uh, any of that. The more I believe that um, I just go back to sort of the things I learned in. Uh, church school, which is there, but for the grace of God, go I. I, I really think that um, the, the idea that people get what they deserve and deserve what they get is, is really false. And so um, I wanted to start at that kind of grandiose place so that she could go somewhere else. Would you share with us a little bit how you actually became an author? I think you told us that you, you worked in a bookstore and I think mm -hmm. you've also been teaching English. Yeah. When did you know you were going to be an author and how did you actually go about setting the, about to write a novel? <laughs> it's funny, I went back to my, um, my university, I went to the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and uh, when my first novel came out, I was 30, and I went back and they, they had one of those things where they're like, look, hello writers, young writers, we will now have her give advice on, on, on how to become a writer. And so they asked me, and I said without even thinking, because it's just actually true, I said, don't, don't have a backup plan. And I could just watch everyone in the room who was older be like, terrible, terrible advice. Um, and of course it is terrible advice, except that I, I think in some ways um, I never had much expectation I would make much of a living as a writer. So um, what I did for the first t ten, 10 years or so, of, um, I did a lot of like service jobs, like waitressing, maid, um, all these kind of things that a lot of the students I have, they'll go into publishing or they'll go into advertising. And it seems kind of like a good thing to do in a way, but it also uses the same part of your brain. Um, also, I don't think it's great to know about the market. I think once you know about the market and everyone says, oh, nobody reads short stories, or oh, uh, everybody wants something that's set in, you know, in the West right now. Th those kind of ideas are really, um, I think they're, they're, they're ultimately useless because all, all we really have is kind of the, the warp and woof of our own voice and our own uh, idiosyncratic way of looking at things. Um, so I think that I was just, um, just dumb enough <laughs> to not necessarily um, think through what it what it would involve to be a writer, and um, and then I'm also that's kind of the only thing I've ever really 
truly like to do other than teach. So I just kind of stuck with it. But, but I've reached many points in my life where everyone around me thought that I was <laughs> not going to write a book. Um, uh, so that's another thing I sort of feel like at the point where people res like look at you with pity and no longer ask about like your, your book, like you're getting close. You might be almost done. Because um, I can remember that. I was like, no one even asked me anymore. No one even asked me anymore if I'm working on my book. That's not good. I was like, I'll show them. Um, yeah. So, but um, I also feel like the main thing I did was I just, um, I read lots of people who are much, much better writers than I was from the beginning. I read, I mean, I still would go and look at whoever was the flavor of the month and, you know, in the old days, check to see when they were born, do calculations. Um, but, but I also, I also felt like, uh, no, I, I, I should always sort of have my, it should always be that I'll never, I'll never reach the level. And I think maybe it's useful that I started out um, taking mo mostly poetry classes. Because one of the reasons I didn't become a poet was because I just thought, oh, I can't become a poet. Like, poets are people like Coleridge. You know, I can't, I can't be that. Um, but it, it ended up being kind of fun to have that background because then it becomes a bit of a hybrid thing. Um, because you have a perhaps exceptionally long writing process, I'm interested in what that contour looks like over the years, whether there are identifiable turning points, like maybe finding the epigraph that you can um, share with us when your maybe posture towards what this project was changed. Mm. Um, I would say there are a lot of um, false alarms where, <laughs> where I think I'm closer to the end of the book than I am. I think that's why it really sucks to be married to a writer because, um, you know, the part where it's like, I'm really pretty sure I'm, I'm, I'm going to be done. I think, I think I'll finish it by, by Christmas. I think I'll, I think I'll finish it by uh, the summer. I think, and then it's always being pushed back. Um, but I think for me, uh, what's been really helpful is to just always have friends who work in other art forms that, they know take a long time. Um, and so fiction, because it does have one foot in kind of like the market or people always imagine like that maybe you could get a movie made of your book or something. There's some way in which people feel like it should move quickly. But you know, if I talk to a friend of mine who's like a graphic novelist or a sculptor or something, it, they might just take years on one piece of work. And so I try to just, um, remember that, for me at least, the only way that I can can make a book that has enough layers in it is is to have enough time pass that I think and rethink about things. So I'm constantly doing other things to sort of um, either make money in the meantime or give myself some space to think about the book. But it often feels um, it often feels like I'm I've made a mistake and I'm writing the wrong book. Um, like really, really often. <laughs> and, um, and then there's also the part where you, you read like a two line description of another novel and you're like, somebody's writing the book I'm writing. That's, that's my book. That's exactly my book. And, uh, and I'll be like, no, it's not gonna be, it is, it's totally my book. And one time I said that and, uh, my boyfriend, now husband, was like, honey, you, you said that before, I don't think it. And I was like, no, it really is, because I was just started writing a book, this is many years ago, and it was about um, Nikolai Tesla and how he fell in love with a pigeon. And I had read this letter, and I'd been working on it for like a year or two, and in the letter he said, yes, I loved her as a man, loved a woman. And I was like, I want to write a whole book about this. And then one night, we went out to, <laughs> to something, and this... Uh, super cool seeming beautiful woman stood up and was like, I'm gonna read from my novel that is about the inventor Tesla and how he fell in love with a pigeon. And I was like, and it was like already like in galleys. And I was just like, no way. And it was true. I'm now, many, many years later, I became friends with her. And I was trying to think like, when's the moment where I tell her about that section where she inadvertently ruined my life? Like, you know, <laughs> like there's like six months where I was just like, uh, but turned out to be a good book, Invention of Everything by Samantha Hunt. Go read it. I didn't write it. You know, I have a question about despair. 
in the, given what's happening with the weather and our, mm -hmm. the rising tide of fascism. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I know you deal with a lot of young people, and sometimes I find myself sort of speechless yeah. with a, a, a person in despair. And so I thought I'd come and you'd tell me what to say. Um, well, I do have a funny idea that I can't prove at all, that like writing fiction and therapy are like mirror opposites of each other. Because I often start kind of with a feeling. Like I'll start with like with Department of Speculation. I was like, this is a book about loneliness. Like it's going to be about the loneliness before you supposedly find someone, but also about the loneliness that opens up in marriage and parenthood and etc. And then I sort of furnish the world. But I feel like when you're telling a story to your therapist, it's like you're like, oh, and then and then there I was, and the refrigerator wouldn't work again, and I went to, and, and the therapist is like, this is about anger. <laughs> you know? um, so, but I do, I do teach um, both undergraduates and graduates, and I will say that over the last, it's one of the reasons I, I decided to write this novel, over the last seven years or so, I, I noticed that um, in, it became almost offhand how they would write or joke about how doomed they were or how they would write about um, how they wouldn't be able to have kids because the world would not be livable um, or it would be a hard moral choice to make. And, and then I would compare those conversations I was having with my students with the conversations I was having with other people my own age, and I'm ex exempting like the few excellent souls I knew who are already doing activism work or environmentalists, but just generally like my story. And I was like, nobody knows this. Nobody's like feeling this who's older. They're still on that timetable, which I was till I dived in one terrible day to the science. Um, and what I realized is like, the last time I had truly thought about it, the timetable was like, oh, things are gonna be really, really bad for your great, great grandchildren. And all of those climate models turned out to be way too conservative. And now the people, one of the reasons that movements like Sunrise Movement or Extinction Rebellion, XR, which is XR Youth, um, I go to those meetings. I'm now, I've now joined Extinction Rebellion. And one of the things that I find is that the youth are not only doing the most amazing activism, but they are incandescent with rage. And most of us maybe don't know that. But the part where part of this book was just me personally wanting to confront my own conscience about my own daughter who's 15 and my students and I just, thought that one day they'd say, so why didn't you, once you sort of looked into it, why didn't you do anything? And here's what my answer truly is. I'd be like, I just don't really like the aesthetics of the movement, like just not that into like, there's nothing like a meeting where you have to like reach consensus by some like long process. Where it was all about like me not feeling at home in that, in that movement. And um, so after I wrote this book, I really started studying what's an antidote to this fear and dread. And, and what I came up with was, was really that it's not about what you do as an individual, it's about what you do um, collectively, what you do joining with others. And so that's what I've ended up um, doing and urging others to do. But I think it's a very American idea that it's all our own fault. You know, w whether it's that you fall several ladders down the economic ladder, or whether it's that you have, like most of the kids I know right now have anxiety disorders. I, I think it's because they're looking at what's happening in the world. <laughs> I mean, it, a lot of it is because they're got this steady drumbeat of, exactly, and then trying to hold that cognitive dissonance. Um, so I just feel like, part of what maybe makes this time so hard is the silence around it, the part where we're not supposed to. <laughs> I mean, I've gotten a few reviews where it's like, 
how interesting, this paranoid narrator who is like always worried about, you know, uh, the, the climate emergency, quote, um, and, and um, the potential of fascism, ha ha. And I, I'm just sort of like, really? Am I the, am I the neurotic one here? Um, or are you actually living in a very sheltered world? Um, that you're not, you're not feeling that. But as a therapist, I imagine people come in and there's been a lot of work now on climate grief and climate dread. And, um, and one of the main things is, uh, is trying to combat the sense of fatalism. Um, and that's, that's one of the things that I'm trying to talk about a little bit with that, this book is that I realized that my own kind of fatalism, once I learned more of the facts, Ultimately, I realized it's kind of a form of denial. It's just like a softer form because it does matter. If it, it, it is going to be bad, but it's going to be worse and it's going to be much worse. And, and at each level, um, human beings are involved and are suffering and that's already happening. So um, I've just tried to figure out how can you do that without being like self-righteous or being someone that uh, nobody wants to hang out with. Um, and uh, I think for a while I was, I was the kind of doomer at the, at the cocktail party. But I'm also like, you know, the person who still eats meat and flies on planes. So I'm not on any high horse here. My question, you were talking about stream of consciousness. Um, and I guess taking a long time to write. Do you, do you sometimes, working that way, feel like you get lost? And how often do you think about sort of like plot and structure versus mm -hmm. sort of getting lost on a tangent. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot about momentum, which to me is a form of a form of plot. Um, I think a lot about how not to have. Um, it's sort of like humans really, really like narrative. That's why we sat around campfires. That's that's why um, mysteries and. Um, you know, romances are always going to be like top selling things because that's, and detectives are, people really like that because it's like, it's a, it's a story. And so I'm, I don't want to be um, dismissive of the love of story because I love it too. I just want to have there be um, other, other ways that the, the book can be interesting and seductive. So for me, that's partly about the language. That's partly about um, ideally there being sort of some comedy as well as some darkness. Um, but in terms of uh, the momentum, it's really important to me that it feels like um, the emotional uh, charge of the novel is there, that, that, that these things matter to the person that is telling the story and that it's not merely um, kind of a set piece for clever observations. But there's a great plot too, super great plot. Everybody, buy, everybody buy the, buy the book. There's a murder in the middle. You know, so you'll never guess who did it. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah.